Hello and full person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss some of the recent discoveries about the mysterious Oort cloud. An enormous cloud of a lot of different icy planetesimals that seems to surround the solar system on all sides, and that seems to extend to a tremendous distance of almost 3.2 light years. But specifically, we're going to discuss some of the recent studies that basically discovered something really unusual about its shape and potentially redefine our understanding of what seems to affect this cloud and how it seems to interact with various inner planets and the galaxy itself. And so let's talk about some of these discoveries in a little bit more detail, but I guess first just a little bit of history of what we know about it and how this was found. And while technically Oort cloud is also known as Opic cloud. And that's because of this wonderful person, Ernst Julius Opic, an Estonian astronomer who was basically very prolific in the early 20th century and who is really famous for two very specific things. The concept known as the Europe effect, or basically the effects the Sun has on a lot of asteroids as it moves them around and makes them spin much faster, and a very early proposition based on a lot of different observations of various comets, that there actually seems to be a reservoir of these comets somewhere on the outskirts of the solar system where most of them seem to be coming from. Especially the comets we refer to as long period comets, like the one you see right here, the famous comet Halley. And he was able to propose this back in 1932, even before we had powerful telescopes. But his idea was then revived by the Dutch astronomer Jean Oort, who was trying to resolve a somewhat unusual paradox. The paradox being that we know comets tend to disintegrate as they come close to the Sun, so they could not be possibly orbiting the solar system for more than a few thousand years. And so a lot of them must have been coming from somewhere, because they could not be formed in their current orbits. But here he actually applied an extremely detailed study using orbital parameters of many different comets to discover that a lot of them potentially have their aphelia, or the farthest point in their orbit, at a distance of approximately 20,000 astronomical units. Or to be more specific, he reasoned that their orbit was not parabolic, as in they were not coming from outside of the solar system, but was actually just extremely eccentric and was basically an ellipse. And because eventually this proposition was accepted, this area, or this reservoir of comets, was eventually named in his honor, Oort Cloud. But basically everything we know about it is essentially theoretical. It's never been physically seen in the solar system, and we've never seen any objects at these distances. Here we're talking about distances from the Sun of 1000 to approximately 100,000 astronomical units. Or maybe even as far as 200,000. And so the shape of this cloud and everything we know about it is basically based on theoretical predictions and simulations. But based on these predictions and simulations, we know that it seems to contain at least two main parts. There is a somewhat disc-shaped inner Oort cloud, also known as the Hills cloud, named after the American astronomer who was able to predict it and explain it back in the days, and a much much larger spherical cloud, or the outer cloud, that wraps around the Sun in the way you see right here. Here the radius of the sphere is at least 2 to possibly 3 light years. And so here you can actually see that the tiny blue spot in the middle, that's basically the famous Kuiper Belt, the only outer region in the solar system that we physically observed previously, and where we have a few probes like the Voyager probes or the New Horizons mission that are slowly moving away from the Sun. But in comparison, the Oort Cloud is much farther away and of course much larger. It extends way beyond heliosphere and is technically inside the interstellar space, and thus receives a lot of effects from a lot of passing stars and even the galaxy itself. We'll discuss some of these effects in a few seconds. But essentially based on the analysis of various comets coming from this region, scientists in the past have been able to estimate the approximate mass of this whole object and of course the distance between various objects. And the current estimates suggest that there are probably trillions of different objects, at least one kilometer in size, which is a pretty normal size for a typical comet we observe in the solar system, and billions of objects larger than 20 kilometers, which would be a very large comet and is thus a lot more rare. If you actually add up all of them, you get approximately 5 Earth masses in total. Several masses of planet Earth orbiting on the outskirts, but objects mostly made out of various ices and things like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and methane. And though obviously we cannot see these directly in the solar system, some of the previous observations from the James Webb like the ones we've discussed recently in one of the videos in the description, basically show us how this particular area seems to have formed and what it's mostly made out of. This is the famous object known as Herbicaro 30, 
that we discussed in that video in the description. And so here this is a baby star where the Oort cloud is still forming and it's basically forming as a result of the interaction between massive objects very close to the star scattering a lot of different particles into outer space where they then form large objects as well. And though by itself this Oort cloud seems to be kind of populated and obviously contains trillions of objects, in terms of individual distances there is a lot of space between each of these objects. As a matter of fact, before they become comets, the separation between each of these objects is potentially at least one astronomical unit, the distance from Earth to the Sun. And so even though this might look crowded, there is a lot of empty space in between. But even though a lot of these objects have been here for over 4 billion years, many of them have been disturbed over time and eventually return to the inner solar system to either become comets and eventually be broken apart by the Sun or to possibly even collide with something, like for example whatever happened here on Ganymede or the famous collision with Jupiter of the comet Shoemaker Levi 9 that was witnessed a few decades back. And in the last few years there's actually been a few studies trying to figure out what exactly causes the disturbance and if any of the collisions on planet Earth possibly came from this region as well. And interestingly, in one of the studies in the description, scientists actually did discover that at least a few meteors potentially had bizarre hyperbolic paths with the trajectory suggesting that they came from the Oort cloud. Now here we're talking about relatively small pieces, basically something that's less than one meter across, but at least four objects have been discovered in the data from the last five years. With the conclusion from the study basically being that if we discover some kind of a hyperbolic meteor, there's actually a really high chance it came from the Oort cloud and not from the outside of the solar system. You can learn more about all of this in the study you see right here. The link should be in the description. But then the question is, what actually causes these objects to change the trajectory and to eventually enter the inner solar system? Well, here there is no one answer, but we know for a fact that nearby star passages seem to produce some of these effects. And so in a different study that you can also find in the description, there's actually an entire list of different stars that passed near the Sun in the last million years or so, and also stars that are going to be passing near the Sun in the near future. But the most well studied and the most well known star is the famous Scholl star. The star that passed through the Oort cloud 70,000 years ago and whose disturbance most likely has not been felt yet. Essentially all of the rocks it disturbed are probably still on their way toward the inner solar system, mostly because for most of them it very likely takes a super long time to travel. Just to give you some perspectives here, one of the fastest space probes out there, Voyager 1, is only going to reach Oort Cloud in approximately 300 years. By then it's no longer going to be functional. But it's actually going to take 30,000 years to pass through this cloud, despite its relatively fast velocity. And so a lot of cometary objects that were disturbed by the Schultz star are still going to take thousands and thousands of years before they enter the inner solar system. Likewise, in some of the previous videos in the description, you can also learn about the next passage that's going to very likely disturb the Oort cloud again. That though is not happening for at least a couple of million years. But the conclusion here was that typically we can expect some kind of a disturbance from a star every few hundred thousand years. Which is of course why we're seeing so many comets in the inner solar system because many of them were disturbed millions of years ago. But turns out, passing stars is not the only disturbance and possibly is not even the main disturbance, because as the scientists in the most recent study discovered, not only is the galaxy itself seems to play a much bigger role, turns out we might have been actually incorrect about the shape of the Oort cloud, because the galactic tides very likely created something that's not a sphere. And instead the Oort cloud very likely resembles something like this. It's essentially an S shape or something that resembles galactic arms. And that's of course the most recent discovery. So here the study by David Nesvorny and his team used the NASA's Pleiades supercomputer to create a very powerful simulation of the debris field of this virtual solar system that was being formed from scratch. And so essentially here they simulated four and a half billion years of the solar system, but with one main difference compared to previous simulations. They applied external gravitational effects from the Milky Way galaxy itself and the tidal effects that it produces on various stars. And as the simulation was being run, instead of forming a sphere and a torus like what we usually see in some of the previous images, in this case the inner region that was believed to be a torus, and that's actually believed to be very stable and tends to be not disrupted by passing stars as much as the outer region, here this flat torus disappeared completely and instead we got a spiral structure. In other words, in some way this actually resembles a typical spiral galaxy, with the entire disk measuring approximately 15,000 astronomical units, but also being inclined by approximately 30 degrees. Or suggesting that the flat toroidal disk might not exist at all. 
But more importantly, they discovered that not only was it actually there for at least four and a half billion years, or it basically formed almost right away, it's also surprisingly stable. In their simulation, it survived for over four billion years and only changed the shape a little bit. And that's despite interactions with other stars or additional orbits around the galaxy. But there's obviously one problem here. Right now, this is still based on theory and simulations, and is not based on direct observations. And even though technically observational data from previous comets seems to suggest that this could be possible without physical observations from the solar system, or at least seeing this in some other star system out there, we're not really going to be able to confirm this. And trying to observe this with current technology is still a little bit difficult. But the thing is, it's actually quite possible. As a matter of fact, it's not the first time the shape of the solar system was redefined through observations and simulations. For example, in one of the older videos, we'll discuss how the shape of the heliosphere, that was always believed to be kind of comet three in shape as well, turned out to be entirely different and basically resembled some kind of a croissant or some other strange pastry. And this was actually physically confirmed later on after the simulations discovered that the shape might not be comet three or spherical. And so something similar is possibly going on here we just need to find a way to physically confirm this through observations. And I guess right now the best hope is James Webb. Hopefully in the next few years, we might be able to observe some other star somewhere out there whose Oort cloud might become visible and reveal its true shape through some very specific observations. As far as I know, it has not been done yet. And so at least for now, all of this is going to remain purely theoretical. Nevertheless, this is still quite a surprising result and definitely once again redefines our understanding of the entire solar system. Which means that we'll come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves to about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.